This is a project of the Mashup Americans. Welcome to Grief Collected, where we explore how grief moves through our bodies, our families, and our communities, and why we need to feel it all in order to transform our future. Today, we're talking to Dr. Dorothy Hollinger, psychologist and author of The Anatomy of Grief. Did you know that grief can change our actual neural pathways? We're going to get into it. Hey, I'm Rebecca Lair. And I'm Amy Choi, and we are the Mashup Americans. Um, Rebecca. Yes. So at this point in our Grief Collected series, we have established that being human is grieving. Yeah, living is grieving, (laughs) loving is grieving. It's very poetic. Um, It is very poetic. And I'm starting to, I'm like, I'm on board with it not being a terrible experience. It's just something that is part of life. And so we got to celebrate it like we do all the other things. But um You know, so we've talked about, like, I think one of the more profound aspects that have come out of our conversation so far with George Bonanno and with Linda Tai is that, you know, to grieve is to be human. And I think one thing that was really fun about what we learned in preparing for our guest today, Dorothy Hollinger, is that grieving is not just to be human, but grieving is to be any sort of living creature. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. I cannot... There's so many animal stories in her book that when we were both reading it, we were just actually crying with, like, amazement. So first of all, there's a story about how iguanas, they stand vigil over their dead friends. And then that led to, like, a whole line of research around maybe dinosaurs also grieved you know? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And the thing is, is, like, the iguana story is so amazing because there are also, of course, which I think people may have heard this before, it's much more common, but this classic story of researchers observing whales that grieve. Like, there is a case of an orca, a mother who her baby died and she carried her calf for seven days, like, on her nose, trying to bring it to the surface so it could breathe. I mean, I love whales. And I know. Uh, and elephants, elephants grieve. They make distressed vocal sounds and facial expressions and change their eating patterns and other actions to signal despair. And they, oh, they also shed tears. Elephants shed tears. Mm-mm. And remember, in George Bonanno talked about how we evolved, our emotions have evolved to sort of signal to people as well, and how our Sad faces helps other people understand that we're sad and need support. Elephants are doing that. She's signaling to our other elephant friends. Okay, but the one that I cannot, we will talk a little bit about with Dorothy, you'll hear in the interview, but crows. Okay, so we know a group of crows is called a murder of crows. Let me tell you what they do. A crow dies, okay? Thousands of other crows in their extended murder crew, okay? show up, they scream for 15 minutes, then they sit silently together, and then they all fly off. It's just, yeah, isn't that incredible? It is, it's wild to me. And it just, um, side note, First of all, I think a murder of crows is the coolest name for like a group of animals ever. Um, But my child is obsessed. One of my children is obsessed with hippos. And did you know what a group of hippos is called? Wait, I actually very hilariously played a game with my whole family the other day where we looked up all the group names, but I I cannot remember. It's called a float. Of course. (laughs) What a it's great name. A of hippos. Uh, uh, okay, well. now I need to learn about how, how hippos mourn. But okay, so back on track. What we're taking from all of these experiences and learning about all of this in Dorothy's book is that grief is not only maybe the most human experience of all, but it is also truly a universal one of basically every living being. And we tend to think about grief Mm, sometimes it's hard when I think about all of the different ways, but we tend to think about grief as a feeling, right? Like, I think that's something that, like, we talked about with Natalia and George is that, like, it often presents as emotions or sadness or anxiety, but it's 
grief is also super physical. And if any of you have gone through this, you know, like I have had the experience of being like, what in that, what is going on inside of me right now? Like what is happening? So common physical symptoms of grief are things like feeling like you have the flu, like that feeling of like having walked into a wall, sleep changes, whether it's insomnia or the reverse, like you're always fatigued, Um, appetite changes, you get headaches and migraines, people get really clumsy. And this is something that happens to me a lot when I'm grieving. It happened to me a lot in the past couple of years where I would just be like dropping things or I'd always have like bruises around my, around like my shins or my hips because I would just walk into things. And it turns out that grief impacts the cerebellum, which is associated with coordination, balance, and also emotions and cognition. What a place. Oh, She's wow. doing a lot. She's doing the most. <laughs> the cerebellum. The cerebellum. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, grief has an impact on the whole limbic system in the brain. So we really need her to be working that limbic system. Wow. Turns out. So much. <laughs> and one of the things here is, you know, I, I mentioned some of this to a friend in my revelations and learning this. And she said, that makes sense because it makes so much <laughs> sense because that is our experience. And it's so validating to actually have it articulated, the science behind it, to understand what is actually happening in our bodies, in our brains, in our hearts, our hearts, which can literally have something called broken heart syndrome, which we'll get yeah. into later. What we're going to get into today is how grief expresses itself in our bodies, how it transforms us, and also, here's the good part, everyone, how we can heal. Our guest today is Dr. Dorothy Hollinger. She is a staff psychologist in the Department of Neurology at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. She was a longtime instructor in psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Hollinger has studied the human brain for over 30 years, and in her book, The Anatomy of Grief, she has drawn from brain science, psychology, paleontology, and literature to describe what happens to the brain, heart, and body of the bereaved. She also has her own psychotherapy practice. So we're going to talk about the science of grief, grief in the body, and all the kinds of grief individuals feel, and get Dorothy's take on what the beginning of collective grief may look like in America. First of all, I think this is something that I was screaming to Rebecca and our whole team about while reading the book was just like, it felt so validating to know that these things are real and backed by science. Yeah. Yeah. Because these are all things that if you have felt grief, you experience it in your body and and you're like, what what's happening to me? A friend died early in the pandemic, not from COVID. It was like a horrible Mm -hmm. traumatic death. And like, I kept dropping my drinks. It was like a weird, I'm not clumsy like that. Like that's not a thing I do. And I think there was something about having experienced all of this, but then seeing that like neural pathways are changed, like knowing that scientists are actually observing these physical, biological changes in us that has been incredibly reassuring in its way. And I just, I wonder from your point of view, what do you think is the most important thing for people to know about the science of grief? Oh, so very many things. Why I wrote the book was to describe to grievers, to the survivors, to the bereaved, whatever word you want to use, that grief affects the entire human self, Mm. the brain, Mm. the heart, and the body. And to be able to know that, to have the knowledge that, oh, okay, I can't think, I, what is the matter? I'm not thinking straight. Well, that could be related and probably is to your grief. Hmm. I write about in the book, a friend of mine lost her sense of taste and for six months. And she told me that it wasn't until she put together that that was about the time her mother died. And as soon as she did, well, not immediately, but her sense of taste returned. Mm. And I think what people are surprised by is how grief can manifest itself in the body or thinking, but you don't know what happened or that you don't make the connection. Yeah, well, I think something that we found really profound in the book is that making that connection between grief and the symptoms 
can actually help alleviate the symptoms. Absolutely. And I wonder if you could share more about that. Like what, what does that mean to be able to say this is grief and then being able to experience some relief from the grief? It's true. This is grief. You've used words to identify something that's going on in your body um, or your emotions. You're naming it and you're using words and words... Um, my goodness, the word that comes to mind for me right now are miraculous. They are. When you begin to use words to describe what you're feeling, what's going on, especially if you're talking about negative feelings and sad feelings like grief, you're changing brain processing. Mm. Part of the limbic system is the amygdala. Uh, that's our alarm system for survival. But what happens, and research has shown this, that activity changes from that amygdala, which is subcortical, up to the right prefrontal cortex, which is part of the thinking brain. Mm. And because that happens, that emotion is calmed down a bit. It's changed in a way that is more tolerable. Mm. And, you know, another part of grief that I think Amy or Rebecca, you touched on was Crying. Mm -hmm. uh, there are three types of tears. Basal, what we have now when it's just your regular moisturizing tears. Um, reactive, which is when you're cutting an onion and the tears want to flush out the fumes. Mm -hmm. And emotional tears. And in emotional tears, you've got a chemical that is related to endorphin. And that chemical is called leucine and kephalin. And that's why we feel good after we cry. It's because of that and Keflin. Incredible. Mm. Um, the heart. Oh, my goodness, the heart. You know, we have a metaphorical one as well as a physical one. But um, physically and medically, something can happen, and it's called broken heart syndrome. I must preface this, however, it's rare. Mm. And there's usually a rapid recovery, and it happens more to women than to men. What happens physically to the heart is that the left ventricle doesn't contract properly and it balloons out. So it has a balloon-like shape. So the mm. bottom of the heart is round and the top where the aorta is, is of course narrow. And that looks like a Japanese octopus catching pot called a takotsubo. Mm. And it was in Japan in 2009 where they've identified this and it's called takotsubo cardiomyopathy. But again, people recover quickly. Yet when somebody comes into the emergency room and they complain of shortness of breath and chest pains, it looks like a heart attack, except mm -hmm. when they do the tests and the enzymes don't show up. <laughs> so uh, there are just so many ways the body responds to grief. A patient just came in recently. She lost a very, very close friend of hers. And um, she kept vomiting afterwards and we both realized as we talked it was she just wanted to get rid of what had just happened mm -hmm. that her friend mm -hmm. had died and of course you can't but I think the link here is to connect grief with what's going on in your body especially if you don't know what's going on like mm -hmm. why am I what what is the matter with me today I'm stumbling like Amy you said something about dropping something or dropping things. And it's a behavior that's changed that you usually don't experience, especially if that's connected to somebody who has just died. You know, it's a good bet that that's really what's happening as your body is expressing your grief. You know, I think you make mention in your book a lot about if grief is not allowed to be expressed or if, you know, if we end up with this sort of forbidden grief, I think what I've been struggling with is if grief is unique to every individual, how do we define what is a healthy grief? Like what is then a full expression of grief? That's a great question, Amy. Um, that people grieve and they can go through the amount of time that their grief needs, and that's different for everyone. Grief has its own timetable that's different for everyone. And don't be afraid of your grief. It's normal. Grief mm. is as large as the love you had for that person. You know, that profound sorrow that we feel after a loved one has died. 
Yeah, that's a simple way of saying that's what grief is. But more broadly speaking, it's the universal response that cuts across species, not just we as humans. I mean, non-human animals show grief and they give themselves permission. I have an example in the book of Carl Safina talks about he and his wife had two ducks on their property and they raised them from ducklings and one of them died and the other one was just absolutely consumed with distress, just running all over the place, which, you know, in a duck life, that lasted for about, I don't know, a week or two weeks. And is that more humane than we as humans, not able to show our grief? Hmm. Maybe more in touch? Well, also your example of the crows who come, they scream for 15 minutes, yeah. then they're silent, and then they leave. I was like, you know what? In a crow's lifespan, that's probably the same as us taking six months to a year to grieve. Yes, yes. And so don't be afraid of grief. Allow it to be felt. It's okay. You're okay. Know that it will and can quiet. But don't be surprised when it erupts. And sometimes it's like, wait, that was two years ago. Why am I crying like this? So the last, as I always say and emphasize, try to so very much, is put grief into words your words, any words, write it in a journal, write it on slips of paper. And also something that may sound strange, paint your grief or garden your grief. You know, if you're a gardener, um, I think the main answer to the question is to be in touch with that grief. So there are three things that I say to patients as well as to people who are grieving. I have three E's, exercise, education, and aesthetics. Mm. Exercise, you know, move. The bereaved, you don't feel like moving. You want to stay in bed. You just want to keep crying. Just move. Just get up from the chair. Get up from the bed. Move around. Go outside. Stretch. And the other, education. Find out as much as you can about your grief, about what's happening, what can happen. I mean, there's my book, of course, <laughs> But there are other books, you know, learn as much as you can. And those who aren't grieving, you know, challenge yourself. And the last one, which I always smile at, aesthetics. Put yourself in places that give you pleasure. Mm. Look at the outdoors when you go out. How You know how beautiful it is, even when it's cold and in the midst of winter. You know, look at the shape of the trees, the branches. Look at the color of the sky how the clouds change shape. Um, go to a museum, <laughs> read a book, go into worlds that are not your own that give you pleasure. And if the book isn't good, do not spend the entire time reading it because you think you cannot finish it. You can't <laughs> stop reading it. <laughs> it's just stop. That's all so, so beautiful. And I feel like uh, just an, in personal grieving, I think, it's, it's evoking so much for me. You know, I'm wearing this ring that was my mother-in-law's, my late oh. mother-in-law's, and I put it on recently because she was an educator and our daughter would have been her first granddaughter, um, oh. is her first granddaughter, but she didn't get to meet her, started kindergarten. And I put oh. it on the day before kindergarten because I was like, oh, I need her to be with us in this yes. moment. And it can evoke tears. It makes me feel her loss, but it also makes her present with me. And I think there's something about the way you're describing the way you can carry something with you and mm -hmm. acknowledge it that both gives it power, but also takes the acute pain from it. And that my personal experience with that has been very ripe with that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's lovely, Rebecca. Also, my ring is really nice. I love this ring. <laughs> Chris was the best. Um, she was the best. Yes, yeah, she was. Well, that marks time number one of crying on the show. Yeah. Just one. There's going to be a lot more. That's pretty good. We have suffered personal losses that are death-related. 
And I think that's one of the ways in which Americans in particular, maybe it's just people in particular, think solely about grief is that you grieve when somebody dies. Then I think there are so many griefs that we are suffering right now. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the relationship between like bereavement, like grief of a loved one versus grief when it comes to something like a loss of faith or a loss of innocence or a loss of, you know, like a hope that I think right now in 2022, if you are a conscious person in this world, there's so much to grieve. Like my husband, he truly grieves his loss of faith as a Catholic, somebody who grew up Catholic and somebody who in some ways always felt like even when he grew away from the church that he would go back to it. And it's hard, just like other grief. Like it comes up, like we'll watch a movie. Do you remember that movie Spotlight about the Boston Globe? Oh, yeah. hometown paper? Absolutely. And there is a scene where one of the reporters in Spotlight, which is a dramatized version of when the Boston Globe investigated the Catholic Church about its sex crimes. And there's a scene where one of the reporters, who's played by Mark Ruffalo, is like just devastated because he was raised Catholic and he's like, just I always thought I would go back and something in this it this broke something in me like this story about the church and my husband who is an emotional guy is like very in touch with things but he's sitting there weeping while we're watching Uh. the movie and for him I think it presents as real grief also and I wonder if like I have felt this in different moments I just wonder like is this also grief And does all the information and the knowledge that we know about grief and our brains and our bodies also apply to grief that is not death? Or loss that is not death, really. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. The way it's made sense for me is to see it on a continuum. There is that death-related grief, which is, there's no grief that's like that because you've lost that person forever. Mm. But there are other griefs that come from different, you know, different stages in your life, you know, developmental stages that one enters into it. And you do grieve many different kinds of losses. And, you know, the loss of a relationship, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, uh, a significant other that has a divorce. And, you know, you also... As one of my patients has said recently, because of the age they are, I miss who I used to be. I grieve that young adult who could do so much. I grieve that person who just would jump into the water or would just throw a softball or a baseball. I'm not that person, and I'm sad, and sometimes I cry about that. Mm. And, it, you know, it's part of that stage of life that Eric Erickson called integrity versus despair. Mm. And it's a tough time. And I think as we're all living longer, that more research needs to be done about this. One of my patients just yesterday, actually, who's in his 50s, said, what about you and your generation who said that as you age, as you get older, you get happier? And I said... <laughs> Listen, I don't know that research. How dare you? How dare you? I don't know that research. I I really (laughs) didn't. And I said, you know, I think part of it comes down to how do you define normal? How do you define happy? Mm. Well, you know, all of this is ephemeral, not normal, but some days we're very happy. Sort of everything comes together. And some days we think, I can't believe I feel this awful. Mm -hmm. I'm not swearing. Mm -hmm. If, if I weren't on this show, Oh, you show, could swear. Swe- oh, you can swear. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is the least I've sworn in a long time, so yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or, you know, uh, when you lose something material, if there's been a robbery, mm. uh, or you've sold a house that you used to love, but your husband still loves, and you couldn't wait to get out of there. <laughs> For um, example. But I think... <laughs> yeah, for example. But, you know, I think all of this comes down to you have to give you permission to feel terrible. Mm-hmm. There are just some times you do. And I think yeah. the more you give yourself permission to do that, the easier it is to be happy and to enjoy being 
happy. The other day I was thinking, wow, I'm happy right now. <laughs> it was just, yeah. it was so strange. I think what was so strange is to think that thought. <laughs> and part of it, I'm happy right now. Well, I love that. That is so gorgeous. And actually, it's realizing, I think, one of the parallels you talk about in your book, one of the kind of many types of grief or loss, and you talked about miscarriage, and then yeah, then more extreme shadow grief. And it almost feels like this could be what Amy, what you were talking about with like the idea of loss of like a, a future that you thought. I mean, at least my yeah. personal experience with miscarriage and fertility stuff is that like, personally, I wasn't grieving any, it was like a sack of cells in my personal experience. And there were physical implications of much of the hormone, all of that. But I was yeah. grieving a future I thought was going to be there that wasn't like I, you know, oh, in January yeah. of this next year, I'm going to have a baby. And what is a baby? Yeah. And what is and that's my, my parenthood begins there. And what is that life? And again, I personally, I was not grieving that I was grieving an idea of a future mm -hmm. that now I have the, a future that's different. It's not that one, it's other ones. And they're these incredible humans and they wouldn't have been these, <laughs> yeah. these people if I had had that other one. And, and I these days think of it only in connecting to people who are suffering through it now, but not as a pain for me. Yeah. But it, it was really like, oh, I, I started to think this is what this would look like. And it's not. And I have to recalibrate that not just, I have to grieve that. I have to feel that yes, loss. Yes, yes. That was, it was nothing except something in my mind, but it was, yeah. that was real. And I think that's what we're doing, Dorothy. I think that Amy and I are doing some grieving around some of the things we thought it would be. And I don't think that we're alone here. I think this is like a very, like a, a lot of people are feeling this. And I wonder like what happens when we think about grief on a societal scale? We've talked a lot about what happens in our bodies and to individuals and how an individual can kind of healthfully let the grief flow through them and tools mm -hmm. for how to name it. But what do we do when like America is grieving? Well, um, uh, it's such a difficult and yet important, important question. Um, it's collective grief that we have that we all experience, and it's, it's outside of our individual grief. I mean, this is so unbelievably complicated. You know, I think knowing that we're strong enough to bear this, to endure it, crisis can create growth, and we do grow we do change. And then our very last question is, what do you hope for the conversation about grief in the future? That people talk their grief, they allow their grief. It's okay, it's part of us. And even if someone has been brought up not acknowledging negativity or negative things, this is not negative. This is part of love. Grief is love. Grief is love lost. Mm -hmm. And it really can be quite beautiful. I know that sounds antithetical to what we feel, but, you know, there's an alchemy. There's a change from grief in its leaden state, but that changes into this golden joy of remembering the loved one who died. Well, that is the best way to end this, which is we agree. And we are so appreciative to you for joining us for spending so much time and sharing your expertise with us. And thank you for for being here. Thank you both doing this interview, prepping for it, answering your questions in my prepping. It's been incredible and has expanded my sense of grieving. Hmm. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dorothy. Thank you to Dorothy Hollinger that I think for both of us, there was, as we said at the beginning, there's so much validation in understanding mm -hmm. the fact that she's observing, researching how we actually are and what is actually happening 
behind the scenes in our bodies and brains to that feels a certain way to us. And mm-hmm. that, yeah, it just feels, in, it, it's been incredible to learn about it. Yeah. And I just also always appreciate when Western science and Eastern medicine come together, mm. you know, because I think that this is something actually that that we have talked about a lot and that that I fully believe that like, you know, the mind body connection, like, mm-hmm. like we are holistic beings, like, and as we're learning here, grief is not just being sad, grief is not just missing somebody, it affects everything in our body. And I think that's something that like, Traditional Chinese medicine, which I grew up with a lot of that, teaches us as well. Yes. And Chinese medicine also has a specific system for grief, which is that you store grief in the lung. And I think as somebody who grew up with Chinese medicine and it's still often scoffed at by so many Western practitioners and you're like, by the way, Chinese people have been around for a very long oh, time. Oh, you want to talk about inflammation now? <laughs> you want to talk about inflammation now? We've now been out hip. here inflamed for <laughs> centuries. Right? But just like knowing again that there's just like more and more and more mainstream consensus that how we feel affects our whole bodies and vice versa, that we are all connected. And so this is I remember just- some having after a, a particular moment of grief in my own life, uh, my acupuncturist being like, oh, of course you have a, a chest cold. Grief is held in your lungs. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, you know, it held. Also, my first migraine came mm-hmm. after some very grieving moments. Yeah, it's incredible. It's a it's a joy to keep learning about this. Truly, um, it's very empowering. So empowering and so validating. So we encourage you to also do your research, and you can start on the website that we made for this project. It's called griefcollected.com. Go there. There are resources. There are articles. There are not places where you can go get acupuncture because I think you need to be like licensed to share that information. But we encourage you to do that too. And in the spirit of Dorothy saying, we need to do aesthetics, we need to look at beautiful things. In a few days, you'll have a meditation in your feed, which is the extraordinary journalist and illustrator, Wendy McNaughton, who started Draw Together. And she will guide us through a drawing exercise to get us out of our heads and into our bodies and breathing and making something beautiful. Ooh, I can't wait. Um, And next week, we'll speak to Rabbi Danya Ruttenberg about community and cultural grief and how we get some repair. The U.S. is so individualistic that when there's any kind of rupture of, of care or loss, we don't know what to do. We don't know how to take care of each other. Well, I'm ready to learn how we can take care of each other better in grief. See you next week. Bye. Grief Collected is a production of the Mashup Americans, executive produced by Amy S. Choi and Rebecca Lehrer. Senior editor and producer is Sarah Pellegrini. Development producer is Dupe Oyabolu. Production manager, Shelby Sandlin. Original music composed by the Brothers Tang. Sound design support by Pedro Rafael Rosado. Website design by Voxy. Grief Collected is supported in part by a grant from the Pop Culture Collaborative. Please make sure to follow and share this show with your friends. Ciao!